Good evening. Good evening. Welcome to tonight's conversation on character, flourishing, and the good life. My name is Matt Crosman. I direct the Life Worth Living program of the Yale Center for Faith and Culture at Yale Divinity School. And over the past three years, my colleagues Miroslav Wolf, Ryan McAnally Linz, and I have had the privilege of teaching the Life Worth Living seminar in the Humanities program in Yale College. I'm so glad to see uh, so many of you here tonight. We are here this evening to talk about perhaps the most important question of our lives. What is the good life? The flourishing life? What is a life worth living? For centuries, this question was the center of every culture and every university. But today it seems we are distracted from this question by the sheer pace of life and the allure of instrumental reason. Consequently, one has the sense that as a society, we believe we can accomplish anything, but perhaps have little idea what is worth accomplishing. The question of worth, of value in its most holistic and interdisciplinary form, namely the question of the good life, demands the very best of our efforts, attention, and intellect, not merely the dribs and drabs of leftover concern that we tend to toss its way. The Life Worth Living program was founded by the Yale Center for Faith and Culture to revive critical discussion in universities and the broader culture about this most significant question. Through our annual course, student fellows program, and campus events, we aim to facilitate conversation across important and enduring lines of difference on questions of meaning and purpose. The course, Humanities 411, Life Worth Living, draws upon a range of philosophical and religious traditions to help students develop habits of reflection that will equip them for the lifelong process of discerning the good life. I can, without hyperbole, say that teaching that course is one of the greatest privileges of my life. So this evening, I hope that all of us together, we get to taste, um, just a taste of what it is to take up life's big question and apply ourselves to it with the best of what we have. I want to take a moment as we get started to thank our many co-sponsors for tonight's event. The William H. Pitt Foundation, the Graduate and Professional Student Christian Fellowship, the Yale Humanist Community, the Yale Youth Ministry and Institute, the John Templeton Foundation, and the Yale Graduate and Professional Student Senate. I'd also like to acknowledge some special guests that we have with us here this evening. Uh, Peter Ansi, uh, Professor of Philosophy, is here all the way from the University of Sydney in Australia, uh, where he was involved in adapting our course uh, at that institution. We also have with us Norma Thompson, uh, the Director of Undergraduate Studies uh, in, in, for the Humanities Program, and Brian Garston, uh, Chair of the Humanities Program in which we teach the Life Worth Living Seminar. At this time, I'd like to invite uh, Professor Garston to share his own welcome. Uh, so good evening, everyone. I am Chair of the Humanities Program, the home of this course in Yale College. And I just wanted to welcome everyone and to say a word about uh, how happy we, were, we are to host this course, which allows students to indulge a curiosity about their own lives in an academically rigorous fashion. Too often, these two pursuits are separate. Students talk with one another in the dorms about the questions most important to their own lives, and they study in their courses material separate from that but in the humanities program, which is an undergraduate-only program, we ask them to study a number of different cultural traditions to gain foundations in those, and then we set them free to construct out of the whole university's humanities offerings uh, a course path that will allow them to explore questions important to them uh, in a disciplined way and with the guidance of, of our DUS, Norma Thompson, students are able to uh, uh, find the rigor and the depth that they want. And so I was thrilled uh, when I spoke to Miroslav Wolf to host this course. And I would say that students who are interested in this course but who want uh, something beyond the course can look to that program, to the humanities program, for other opportunities to indulge these curiosities and more than that, to discover who they really are, which is the project, one project of college. 
Um, so I just want to add my welcome and thanks to the sponsors of this course and wish you a good evening. Of course, discernment of the good life extends far beyond the classroom, and so um, our Life Worth Living Fellows, a committed group of undergraduates, work to curate conversations that invite our campus and in our city and indeed our world to engage with life's most enduring questions. And it is in that spirit that they have labored so diligently in hosting tonight's event. The format for this evening will be rather straightforward. Um, our guests will take turns interviewing one another, um, each for a little bit more than a, than a half an hour. Uh, Mr. Brooks will start off as the interviewer. To introduce our guests of honor and kick off our evening, I'd like now to turn things over to Kelsey Kaywood and Nina Campbell, the co-leaders of this year's Life Worth Living Fellowship. It is my privilege to introduce our first guest of honor this evening. David Brooks is an op-ed columnist for the New York Times and appears regularly on PBS NewsHour, NPR's All Things Considered, and NBC's Meet the Press. He teaches at Yale University, is a senior fellow of the Jackson Institute of Global Affairs, and is a member of the Cad American Academy of Arts and Sciences. He is the best-selling author of Bobos in Paradise, The New Upper Class and How They Got There, On Paradise Drive, How We Live Now and Always Have in the Future Tense, the Social Animal, The Hidden Sources of Love, Character, and Achievement, and The Road to Character. Our second guest of honor is Miroslav Wolf, the founder and director of the Yale Center for Faith and Culture, and Henry B. Wright, Professor of Theology at Yale Divinity School. Professor Wolf studied philosophy and theology in his native Croatia and in the United States, and earned doctoral and postdoctoral degrees with highest honors from the University of Tübingen, Germany. His book, Exclusion and Embrace, was a winner of the prestigious Grawmeyer Award in Religion, and Christianity Today named it one of the 100 most important religious books of the 20th century. His most recent book is Flourishing, Why We Need Religion in a Globalized World. Please join us in welcoming to the stage David Brooks and Miroslav Volf. Uh, welcome to today's debate on human flourishing. Miroslav is for it, I'm against it. <laughs> uh, I actually come from a series of institutions that have been hostile to US flourishing for decades, uh, the New York Times, uh, where I'm the conservative columnist, a job I'm likened to being the chief rabbi at Mecca, uh, and uh, the University of Chicago, uh, which has been hostile to my flourishing for four years. Um, my favorite saying about Chicago is it, it's a Baptist school where atheist professors teach Jewish students St. Thomas Aquinas. Uh, okay, uh, so we'll start with a simple and obvious question. Uh, your book is called Flourishing. What does it look like? That's a great question to start. <laughs> so I think of flourishing as having three formal components. One component is life is going well for one. The other component is life is being led well. And the third one, in some sense, life feels also good. The first, life going well, uh, describes the circumstances of our lives. We need to have certain a level of peace uh, in social settings. We need to have our bodies nourished in certain ways for us to be able to say that we flourish. Uh, second is um, life being led well. We need to act uh, in ways that are appropriate. We need to have a form of character that is, uh, that is appropriate. And the third component, probably very popular these days in the wider culture, is life has to feel um, good, feel uh, right. And that can be, sometimes um, people think of it as kind of unimportant in, in some ways, uh, but at the same time, without a sense of life feeling right, we cannot be said to flourish. In the biblical traditions, uh, both Jewish and Christian, these are summed up in uh, terms like uh, peace for life going well, righteousness for life being led well, and joy for life feeling just right. 
Uh, so uh, as you're speaking, I'm thinking of Kanye West. Uh, he, he would say, my life is going well, I got a lot of money, my life is being led well, uh, Taylor Swift hates me, uh, and I'm certainly <laughs> feeling good about myself. Uh, so that seems maybe uh, not as tight a definition as one you would want. Well, I think um, those are formal components uh, <laughs> of it, right? So everything depends not so much of uh, all these three things being present, but everything depends, I think, on giving these uh, components uh, their the kind of robust, uh, robust character. Uh, if you think of it simply as uh, our subjective understanding uh, of it, uh, you might feel okay for a while, and then you might not quite feel away, uh, okay for, for a while. A flourishing, I think, is something also that extends over a period of time. A flourishing is something that uh, characterizes our entire, entire lives. And there are these rich traditions of thinking about what it means for circumstances to be right, what it means to inhabit, for instance, in just and peaceful social order. Their whole tradition of thinking of what does righteousness actually mean? Uh, what does it mean acting uh, rightly so that it isn't simply uh, kind of a subjectively felt action? Yeah. So for your flourishing, does it involve some eternal external standard? I think it does. It does. Uh, I, I think that's really where the, the great uh, traditions come, whether they're philosophical or whether they're religious uh, traditions. They kind of map for us uh, the account of who the self is, uh, what the social relations are, and what the good is that we ought to aspire. And these traditions are almost like um, a kind of repositories of the standards by which we evaluate our lives. Mm -hmm. uh, and obviously there are multiple uh, traditions and they sometimes conflict and that's really what the course A Life Worth Living is about, that's partly also what my book is about, is trying to figure out how among these uh, major traditions that hold uh, not just uh, opinions of people but affections uh, of people and shape their practices, how we can engage in meaningful debate in the very much uh, uh, pluralistic world that globalization has created. Right, but in, in the, bo the book, and even the title of the book, um, it's not just traditions you're talking about in the book. In the course, you've got secular traditions. In the title, you've got religion. Yeah, so the, 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 the title, subtitle is Why We Need Religion in a Globalized World, which raises the question, why do we need religion in a globalized world? <laughs> <laughs> it does raise that question, and hopefully <laughs> the book provides uh, certain answers uh, for it. I think, um, so, so the purpose of the, of the book, in a sense, Generally, people, when people think today of uh, religion in globalized world, what comes to mind immediately is uh, the ways in which religions, I would put it, profoundly misfunction in the ways in which religions are highly inimical to life, to flourishing life, and their whole set of uh, uh, precepts and practices and authorities are meant to kind of suppress uh, life. Obviously that happens as well. I try to look at, at religious tradition from the other end. There's this other side, they're highly ambiguous, ambivalent phenomena, but there's this other side of religions. And I think that a great religious traditions are probably our most potent repositories of the visions of the good life, of the visions of flourishing life. And that's why I concentrate on them. My suggestion is not that there are not other alternatives to religions. Indeed, uh, religions have been criticized even in their best form. And I think those criticisms are significant, ought to be taken into account. But religions bring something significant. And I think uh, equally importantly, religions in fact are embraced by majority of the world population, and the world is becoming, for ill or for good, more of a religious place than it ever was, both in absolute and in relative terms. And so we have to take these accounts, work with them, and see in what ways they can be actually sources of significant wisdom for us. So I'm a Yale undergrad. I'm being sucked inexorably to Goldman Sachs uh, and into a world of the global economy uh, and a certain value system yeah. What, is, what is a religion, pick any one or all of them in general, what is it offering me? 
I think religion will offer you a sense that your life is not primarily about yourself, that you're joining, going to Goldman Sachs or whatever other firm might be, might be a good option for you, but you better think in what ways it will serve something larger than just your individual needs, in what ways it can be tied to a sense of solidarity, solidarity at national level, but really also solidarity at the global level. It kind of frames, I think, your, your life by challenging you to ask, uh, to what end am I working for Goldman Sachs? What are the purposes of my existence and therefore purposes of this particular activity that I undertake? I can be stellar at a variety of, activi of activities that I do, but what ends do they serve? And I think that's the fundamental religious question, in many ways, fundamental philosophical questions, of purposes of human existence. This is what religions provide. So what's equally as good as working at E. Coleman Sachs that religions can offer me? Well, what's the compelling counterculture? Like, what's the substance of that counterculture? I think it will depend on individual callings that people might have, but I don't see any reason why uh, washing the feet of uh, the destitute uh, and uh, um, helping them raise uh, their children, why digging wells in Africa, or you name a variety of things in which we uh, engage our fellow human beings, the poorest of the poor, why that might not be as noble, indeed, why that wouldn't be even more noble uh, job than working for Goldman Sachs. So, so you said it, it, religions make us think of a context bigger than themselves and serving the poor in Africa, but every U2 song does that. And so why, why do you need the, it, it seems to me, are, aren't you taking God out of the equation in the religious conversation? Um, no, I think there, there are multiple ways in which uh, encouragements of this sort uh, can, uh, can take place. So the question might be, so why, why what, what role does God, uh, does God play? I think we live in the kind of environment, uh, and, uh, and again, a variety of ways uh, one can probably get at certain, certain of the goals that I'm describing. But certainly in religious, religious traditions, um, in the context, say, of market economy in which we find ourselves today, uh, in which new consumer goods are created, the new desires are being generated, in which we seem to be running uh, faster and faster to stay in the same place, a kind of sense of relativization of ordinary life's goods, at least as portrayed in these kinds of uh, economic, our economic imagination, is an extraordinarily important thing. I think uh, religious traditions take us out of ourselves, take us into something that is, that is transcendent and free us from uh, being compelled to pursue um, new gadgets in order to satisfy the craving of the self. Can you be good without God? I think you can be good, uh, good without, uh, without God in, a sense, in, in, in this sense. I mean, I'm, I'm obviously a, a religious person, I, I'm a Christian. Um, you can be good without believing in God, but that does not quite mean that you're good without God, right? If uh, you are, as, as I do, if you believe that God created the world, that God created uh, everything that, that is, indeed that every breath of ours is dependent upon the existence uh, of God, then you really can't be without God, but if you can be without God, you can be also good without uh, God. So in a sense, the goodness, and if you postulate that God is a good God, goodness has its source, truth and beauty, and goodness have their source in God, and therefore whether you actually believe in God or not, you are good on the count of their being. Right. But, but, you know, the, your, the, the book is about the, the uses that religion serves yeah. in providing a counterculture to global capitalism, really. And, and so someone who's not conscious of any transcendence, mm. I mean, I observe in my own life a, a lot of religious people I know are completely wonderful, and a lot of religious people I know are complete schmucks. 
uh, and a lot of atheists are wonderful, and a lot of atheists are schmucks. And it's, it's harder than it should be to draw the line. Uh, and so if you think, if you have no consciousness of any transcendent realm, mm. do you think you're at a disadvantage in leading a flourishing life? Well, I mean, the, depending on what you think about, about transcendent realm, right? There, there are these, um, as you say, a lot of religious people are complete schmucks. Uh, and a lot of religious people also, indeed, that's the pervasive propensity of religions, and that's why religions deserve a, a critique, is to kind of instrumentalize religions for goals that are extraneous to the uh, original teachings of the religious uh, tradition. And so religions become uh, uh, kind of prosperity religions. <laughs> religions become, quote unquote, political religions in the sense that their entire purpose is there to stabilize uh, kind of uh, ordinary and secular, secular order. In some ways, you can say this is a already first step at the secularization right. of uh, religion at undermining what religion indeed ought to be uh, about. Unfortunately, it happens very often and to a large degree. Yeah. Okay, I've been asking you a series of questions really at the personal level of how one's, one's individual life is influenced by religion or can be. But the, the book is mostly on the realm of systems, on the, the, the realm of the global etho, the global world. Uh, could you sort of step back on and describe to us right now, right now uh, the world seems to be uh, being torn apart both by globalization and by religions. Would you, yeah. would, would you say it's a, the order seems to be falling apart under both influences? Is it, I'm just really asking you to step back and yeah, okay. describe the state of the world you describe in the book. Yeah, in some, ways, in some ways I feel that both the globalization processes and religions, and religions are really global phenomena. Indeed, I try to argue in the book that uh, religions are, the world religions are some of the original globalizers. It's in world religions that um, human beings, qua human beings are thematized, that universal ideologies are being, are being articulated. So both of them are global, a global phenomena, and both of them in some ways are in a profound, in a profound crisis. Uh, religion certainly um, uh, kind of con partly because they identify with particular, particularist projects, they get uh, embroiled in conflicts that exist between people as a result partly of globalization, uh, globalization processes. And so globalization, uh, it seems to me, by bringing the world uh, together, in some ways also accentuates the differences. Uh, living in proximity becomes, uh, becomes difficult for people and religions participate just in those kinds of tensions. Right. Let's start with the globalization piece. My, uh, I remember in 1990 or so, after the Berlin Wall fell, I think I'm right in this, a guy named Kenichi Omai wrote a book called The Borderless World, or argued that borders were disappearing, there's another guy whose name I've forgotten, wrote a book called The World is Flat. Uh, and, and, uh, and do you, do you think global capitalism has, has not turned out to fulfill those hopeful expectations? Um, if those are hopeful uh, expectations, it is. <laughs> it has turned out not to fulfill those uh, hopeful expectations. And partly it hasn't fulfilled those hopeful expectations because it is increasingly, increasingly not delivering, not simply on, not on, the, on, the, on the creation of wealth, but on the ability to distribute the wealth in any kind of a fair way. We see in huge and immense discrepancies of wealth uh, today. And I think they are some of the major causes of tension. They're the causes of tensions in my reading. I'm not an expert in this, but in my reading, they're causes of tensions in this country, but they're causes of even greater tensions, uh, tensions globally. And so, do you think they distort flourishing up and down, that, that, those inequalities? We're here at Yale, we're at a very unequal place. Um, I think they distort, distort uh, flourishing in significant uh, ways. I think we cannot properly flourish. Um, ourselves when other people aren't flourishing. In some ways, I think of flourishing as um, not individual, simply thing. It's a social flourishing. 
uh, flourishing of one person is tied to the flourishing of, of others, and therefore my flourishing is tied with the flourishing of, of the entire planet. And I think this kind of flourishing is being, uh, uh, being significantly eroded uh, at, and in some places uh, radically destroyed by the present form of capitalism. Mm -hmm. Uh, let me challenge you on that. Be, the, religion is based on love, uh, as you write in here, and love is problematic because it's particular and it's preferential. Mm. And so when you start making a, saying my flourishing depends on the flourishing of the whole world, it seems to me, aren't you watering it down and, and sort of having a vague global human, humanism and not any actual religion as we know it and see it? I'm, I'm not sure. I, I think that global, at least the, the, the religions like Buddhism or Christianity or, or Islam, uh, in certain respect, Judaism uh, as well, the Judaism is a particular case, um, they are global religions. They address individual and address potentially every individual in the same way, who's my neighbor, was a classical question, and neighbor turns out not to be my core religion. It's neighbor turns out to be a person who isn't my core religion. So uh, kind of fundamental stance is actually to uh, treat every human being as equal, whether one belongs to my group, in group or out group. And that, I think, is a very important dimension of, uh, of the great religious tradition. But w would it be accurate to say that the most religions of the world are turning more particularistic in Judaism, the Orthodox flourishing over the conservative and the reform, and pr Protestantism, obviously, for at least for a while, evangelicals and Pentecostals flourishing over the mainstream, uh, and Islam, it seems, it seems to be moving in also in a more orthodox or even radical direction? Well, I would distinguish uh, moving in orthodox directions and being universalistic in a sense, right? Universalistic in the sense of treating all human beings as not, uh, not distinguishing clearly in-group and out, uh, an out-group in a sense of uh, responsibility that we have toward, toward them. And there you have uh, some very conservative religions who, religionists who would do just that because of the commitments that they have, uh, they have to, uh, to, their own, uh, to their own faith. Um, think of Buddha, for instance. Uh, I mean, it seems to me that uh, you can't be more specific in terms of Buddha, Buddhism than who B Buddha was, right? right? In terms of articulating the, the, the precepts of the religion. Nonetheless, it has a uni had universalistic message in that sense mm -hmm. for everyone and not just to the in for the in-group. And what, in general, what do you see trends in religion? I mean, obviously, the, the secularization that people expected yeah. has not happened. So what, what is the reality of, of turn, just the evolution of religion in the globalized world? You know, if I see any, any, uh, any trends, uh, I, I, see, I see religion uh, in some ways thriving, right? It doesn't mean that the number of seculars is increasing. In fact, it is. I think the function of religion striving and secularism and since striving is, is a function of, of uh, population growth uh, in, to significant degree. There are differences among religions in terms of conversationist religions or simply population growth religion, religions. But uh, you do see growth, you do see uh, political engagements. Where I see actually, what I see actually happening, I think, is that increasingly religions are uh, being pushed to become less political religions, mm -hmm. but more, quote unquote, prosperity religions. Mm -hmm. So that their own religious teachings are functionalized with regard to individual, uh, maybe communal, but primarily individual prosperity. The more religions are aligned with a kind of yeah. s uh, economic system, the more they become servants of that economic system. And I think in some ways, in a different way than when they align themselves with political systems, betray their original, uh, original calling. Which is not to say that religions ought not to be politically engaged or have nothing to say, contribute to the stability of economic system. But if you functionalize them with regard to political systems or economic systems, you fundamentally betray the yeah. character of religion. Yeah, I mean, I gather you want them to be a, a counter pressure. Uh, and now, uh, I'm, I'm hopeful that they can be that. Sometimes yeah. I'm despairing a little bit. <laughs> yeah. So in the 1950s, there was Reinhold Niebuhr, there was Martin Buber, there was Abraham Joshua Heschel, there was Martin Luther King in the 60s, a series of religious leaders and theologians who took a very active role in the public square, introducing concepts like sin and grace and redemption into public debate. Yeah. 
it seems to me that there are very few of the, such people around today. Uh, theologians or clergy who are real public figures, public mm -hmm. knowledge, in the way Reinhold Niebuhr was. Do you, and this book is sort of an attempt to get back in that world. So wh wh first of all, why did those sort of secular sermons go away? Uh, and is this indeed an attempt to, to bring some of the religious thinking to public question? Well, I think we find ourselves in a, different, uh, in a significantly different situation. We were, at the time of Niebuhr's, we were in a, a, a country that was, and indeed in a kind of, well, not just country, but, uh, but the Western world, that was still, uh, though nominally, culturally, in a significant, to a significant degree, a degree Christian. Uh, when you have that kind of cultural environment, you can address with Christian conceptualities, you can introduce some of these uh, concepts, and they will do some significant cultural work. If, uh, as the culture becomes more pluralistic, uh, you have less chance of doing this. And in a sense, in a different way, what I'm trying to do in this book is to kind of name a pluralistic context for us and to plead for the uh, for the role of varieties of religions, including secularism, in the public, public sphere, bringing their visions of the good life. So what's similar that you have in all the traditions, the visions of a good life uh, teased out across those traditions are being brought into public sphere. I think this can be done and ought to be done in a pluralistic way. And I, the argument of the book is that actually religious traditions have internal resources to approach the issue in just such pluralistic, uh, pluralistic way. Yeah. Well, this sort of brings us back to the course. Is the purpose of the course to present to students, there's a range of moral traditions. I'm at, I'm at a secular university. I'm not going to tell you which one to believe in, but pick one. Or is it just, is, is, are you just trying to introduce students to moral categories, moral ecologies, different moral traditions? No, actually, we, actually, we're doing something, something different than either of these, these two options. It's not introducing simply, simply students of, uh, uh, to options, uh, and it's not certainly um, uh, uh, kind of advocating for uh, one particular uh, tradition. I think it's important to introduce these traditions not simply as the content, here's the tradition, now, now choose, but rather to uh, have an interface between student and the tradition as, some, as a tradition that makes claim to truth and therefore also a claim on their lives. To, in a sense, figure out how might life look like <laughs> if it was lived from that uh, perspective. Uh, what if I take seriously those claims? Provisionally, I take them seriously, wrestle with them, um, and then I will have opportunity to reflect about my own life and to what extent that might or might not fit what I, who I imagine myself to be. So what, what would life be like if I really lived like Jesus, if I really lived like Buddha, if I really lived like Nietzsche? Or, or something of the sort, right? So, so obviously we can't introduce uh, students into uh, the, the entirety of the religious tradition or into the entirety of the life of, uh, of uh, the great founders, a founder. But we ask certain forms of questions, uh, which uh, when it gets my turn to ask you, I will, I will articulate uh, so as to focus the discussion uh, around the questions of the good life and then ask students, given what they have read, try to imagine yourself what it would look like. Try to explore your own life, life uh, around you, and figure out whether that contributes uh, somehow to you living more truthful life, meaning uh, fitting to what we know about the rest of the reality, uh, more beautiful life, uh, and good life. So, are they meaner to each other on Nietzsche Week? Or like they like? <laughs> uh. You know, it's it's very interesting. We we, we try to to figure out so so. What might, what might it be to actually l kind of engage in, uh, in interchanges as Nietzsche might, uh, might do? <laughs> yes. uh, and, or what might actually, the interesting question was, so let's try not to uh, imagine and think of Nietzsche simply as, uh, you know, we know what the problem is with Nietzsche, uh, will to power and stuff like that. We try to ask students, now imagine that you took that on, what would be good about this? 
<laughs> what kind of good is Nietzsche articulating and how might it apply to the set of relationships to be, in which you find yourself and, and the life you live? So in a sense, we want those traditions to become alive yeah. for them. So let me come back to a theme which has undergirded a number of my questions, and that's about pluralism. You've been, even in the last half hour and in the book, extremely respectful of pluralism. Uh, and is there a danger that uh, you're watering down the message that, I mean, nobody goes to a game, nobody goes to church on Sunday morning or synagogue or mosque to worship pluralism. Uh, they want a, the particular thing. Uh, and that in, in sort of stepping back and having a stepping back stance that all religions offer different things, you're losing some of the focus maybe that you feel personally in your own faith or that any Muslim would feel or any Jew would feel or any atheist would feel, that you're sort of making it more nebulous than it needs to be? Well, um, I hope I'm not converting people to pluralism, <laughs> right? Pluralism, qua pluralism, right? I don't think that would, be, that would be the right way. I think we live in a situation of contending particular universalisms. Right? Those religious traditions and philosophical traditions, they are contending particular universalisms. They're particular. And my sense of myself is that I am a member of one of these contending particular universalisms, right? I think we have a challenge of how to make fruitful for our lives together just such inhabiting of particular religious or secular traditions in a way that can make for peace of living, living together and contribute to something, something robust, robust discussion, and therefore improve the relations uh, between, be, enrich the tradition. Yeah. And I feel that I, when I have dialogue with my Muslim friends, or when I have dialogue with Martin Haglund, uh, who's sitting, sitting here, I don't feel like I need to sacrifice anything. I feel that I can be particular and just as particular person engage in this debate. But you have to know, you're talking to a person who for an entire year, as a Christian, committed Christian, I'm a Christian theologian, what do you expect of me, had Nietzsche on his nightstand and read Nietzsche for devotions. Um, <laughs> and I, I was deeply enriched by that because it was kind of extraordinary to interface this immensely smart and sensitive, even though in my perspective, majorly misguided uh, intellectual uh, with my own perspectives, it, it was uh, wonderful. I, I became kind of a Nietzsche devotee in some ways. When I was teaching uh, in my previous teaching uh, position, I taught a course, Nietzsche for theologians, and for entire course, I made a stipulation that students cannot say one negative thing about Nietzsche. They need to think about what might be right about Nietzsche, <laughs> uh. which was very difficult for some. So give us an example. <laughs> of what, what might be right yeah. about Nietzsche? <laughs> like, how does it help you as a Christian to read Nietzsche? Um, well, I would just, uh, just think, think, of, think of the uh, critiques of, uh, of uh, just think of will to power, or think of the crit critiques of religion uh, as kind of expressions of resentment. Uh, it's very easy to indicate how Nietzsche might be right and how I might, uh, as, as a Christian or as a religious person more generally, whether I'm Buddhist or Christian or, or Jew for that matter, how I might be enriched by, by reading Antichrist, yeah. right? By reading a, a kind of the, this shrill critique but immensely uh, perceptive about uh, discrepancies, about twists of my own religion, I think it's tremendously important. Yeah. And I, you know, my, my sense is the kind of the first uh, critics of, of religion in, in many ways, in the, it, it, certainly in the, in, the, in the Hebrew Bible and the, in Christian Bible, prophets. They were relentless. And I think religions without prophetic critique of religion, uh, they will uh, do a lot of harm. Yeah. I want to get to uh, your epilogue, which is so wonderful. Uh, you talk about, you quote Nietzsche and you talk about nihilism. Uh, and it, it might be useful to describe the forms of nihilism you see. The reason religion is necessary as an antidote is because of, because of this. And it might be useful for you to describe those forms of nihilism you see particularly threatening and prevalent in the world. 
Well, you know, so, so one of the ways in which Nietzsche uh, has, a, uh, has a critique of religion, religion is a form of, uh, form of nihilism. We always, the uh, kind of religious people think of Nietzsche as being kind of nihilistic uh, philosopher. And there's a certain sense in which he is, but he sees in religion something profoundly inimical to life and therefore nihilistic, right? And so you can see some forms of fundamentalist religions that, that, they're, that they're just like kind of claws coming from above and squelching anything that's underneath this thing. It's, it's extraordinary. So you have this tender plant of life that's not nourished, but that's kind of squelched, squeezed into uh, molds. And obviously people, people rebel, you know. The, the famous three metamorphoses in Thus Spoke Zarathustra, uh, you know, camel that bears. That's your conservative, uh, uh, oppressive uh, religion. Lion roars, rebels against uh, that, that kind, of, uh, kind of religion. And then the next metamorphosis is a, is a child. And in some ways, uh, Nietzsche has this sense of um, uh, kind of the play, but play itself now, from my vantage point, end up being also a meaning, meaningless play, unbearable lightness uh, of being. And I think we move between these kind of two nihilisms and almost displayed in the, at the world stage, kind of oppressive religious nihilism and nihilism of the kind of absence of meaning, uh, nihilism of, uh, um, well, unbearable lightness of that which we do, something that profoundly attracts but is not significant in our lives. And so globalization is creating that, is encouraging that second form. Of it's encouraging that second form, and it's encouraging then also reaction <laughs> to that second form in form of oppressive religious tradition. So it's a flight from meaninglessness into crushing and oppressive meaning, and of course, a flight from crushing and oppressive meaning back into the other one. So the pendulum kind of swings between right. these two. Uh, yeah. that, that's how it seems to Which me. Which is actually what you see in the, if you read about the suicide bombers or the guys who join ISIS, they were like bodybuilders just worshiping their body and then they flip over and become ISIS members. Interesting. Uh, back and forth. Uh, and so, and then finally the, um, the sweet spot. <laughs> So you've described these two nihilisms. Yeah. And obviously the, the, the big question then, uh, then becomes, is it, is it possible somehow to combine um, the kind of the, the, the freedom and pleasure with, uh, the, with the belief, robust belief in, in God? And my argument uh, uh, toward the end of the book, it's my, I give my own reading of things, uh, is that uh, pro properly understood, if you think of God as a creator, properly understood appreciation of the world as creation actually enhances the joy in the world, uh, joy of the world itself, right, rather than taking away from it. The famous critiques of uh, how Dante, when he was led uh, to uh, behold God by Beatrice, suddenly leaves Beatrice and their love uh, by the wayside in order to be completely immersed in the beauties of God. The world disappears and God is only the object, uh, object of love. I think if you think of God as a creator, if you think of how, our, how, how we read creation, not simply as things or, or, or how we relate to things in the world, they're not things for us primarily. They are almost like, like relations. And I give example of uh, my father's um, um, ink pen that he gave me. It's, a, it's an object, but it isn't an object. When I touch it, it's infused with the presence of my, uh, of my father. And in some ways, that's how we religious people, properly who believe in God, relate to ordinary things in life. They aren't just things. They're infused by, by presence. They are sacraments of relationships. Yeah. And in that sense, affirmation of God is affirmation and the joy and the goodness mm. of the world. So I've been admiring your silk handkerchief in your pocket. Uh, and how is that an affirmation of, <laughs> it's, it, it you know, this seems, is a good, this is, <laughs> I mean, it seems to me you're, I, I, I get what you're saying, but it seems to me you're asking too much of some of our everyday pleasures. So I read a book recently that said there are four levels of happiness. Uh, there's the, uh, just material gratification, very nice suit, nice handkerchief, uh, nice car, it's fine, it's, that's Leo's happiness. Then there's, um, Ego comparative happiness, the, the pleasure we get being better than other people at things. 
Then there's uh, generative happiness, the pleasure we get from giving back to each other. Mm -hmm. And then finally there's transcendence, some sense of one's place in a cosmic order. Uh, and it, it seems to me that we can have gradations of happiness, but we don't have to invest every Snickers bar in sort of a God's, in transcendence, which it seems to me maybe what you're doing, no? <laughs> well, I, I, I think uh, if I'm just investing it with transcendence, uh, my investments are going to dissipate very quickly. <laughs> you know, so, so I think if there's anything, there is a kind of perception uh, of the world as, as a gift. And obviously there are gradations uh, of one, one perceived gradations of one, one's, uh, one's awareness, but that doesn't take away from the possibility of the, the intense pleasures that we have, seeing them as something imbued with more than just the thing itself and its particular relationship yeah. uh, to me. But I think we have to talk about your book okay. as well. <laughs> Shoot. Shoot, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, you know, may, may, maybe just for, for the beginning, you build in your book on the, uh, on the distinction with uh, uh, the Rabbi Soloveitchik made between uh, Adam the first and Adam the, the second. You use this slightly differently than he does. Can you just spell out who's, the, who's Adam one and who's Adam two? Yeah. Or who's Eve one and yeah, Eve two? I, I meant to make it gender neutral. Um, but yeah, Adam one is the, uh, Soloveitchik, the, he's a great dualist. Uh, there's, there's this line that there are two sorts of people in the world, those who divide the world into two sorts of people and those who don't. Uh, and he, wa he was a big dualist and believed in dichotomies and tensions. Uh, and basically Adam one is the building creative Adam. Uh, and, and Adam two is the inner and the spiritual Adam. Uh, one is majestic Adam, as he put it, and one is humble Adam. And so the way I formulate in the book is that there are two sets of virtues. One, the, the resume virtues, which make you good at your job, good at being a teacher. And then the eulogy virtues, the things they say about you after you're dead. Whether you're courageous, honest, honorable, capable of great love. And we live in a world, and I think I would include this institution, where we're a lot clearer about how to build the resume virtues than the eulogy ones. People have a clearer sense of how to have a good career than how to build a good inner character. It's not that people are bad, but they're just lacking a moral vocabulary for how to do that. Mm -hmm. And I certainly found that in my own life. I mean, the book really emerged because I'd achieved way more career success than I ever thought I would, but uh, I hadn't achieved the sort of uh, inner light one sees in people. Uh, I went to Frederick, Maryland shortly before finishing the book, and I uh, ran to some ladies who teach immigrants English and then how to read, which can take years. And I just walked into this group of 35 women, age 50 to 75, and they just radiated a patience and a calm and a joy and just a tranquility and just a goodness. They made me feel important. They had no idea who I was or anything. And you think, well, I've achieved this in life, but what they have, I haven't achieved that. Mm. And so it just struck me as important to know how to get there. Mm. And so the, the book is based on a series of mini biographies and every single person was pathetic at age 20, but kind of magnificent at age 70. Mm. And so they weren't born good, but they did something to make themselves good. So you read, uh, uh, just as a footnote, you, you read uh, Rabbi Soloveitchik as as a kind of a dualist, uh, rather than uh, both incorporating in us That's both fair. dimensions. Yeah, that, it's about balance. Uh, yeah, yeah. For, for him, it's a, those are two modalities of right. human destiny, right? But yeah. the, the reason I'm asking is that, so for you, as maybe for him, but for you, you're the object of, of discussion. Uh, for you, the, what, what's the, what's the we, we know what good Adam one does for Adam two. You can't have character without existing. But what good is Adam two for Adam one? Well, I do think uh, that's a good question. So uh, sometimes humility uh, is not the most positive virtue. Uh, if you're running for president and competing with Donald Trump. Uh, <laughs> but I would say basically character is about relationships. And, I mean, if you want the Adam one, if you want the, this world reason to be a good person, I would say that the capacity to build trusted relationships is a very valuable commodity. So, for example, in World War II, they drafted hundreds of thousands of young men, uh, and a certain number rose to the rank of major, and some stayed privates and corporals. 
And so they did a study. What are the factors that explain or correlate with those who rose and those who didn't? And it could be intelligence, it could be physical courage, but those correlations were extremely weak. The strongest correlation was having an intensely loving relationship with your mother. Uh, because those who could accept and absorb and understand how an intensely loving relationship worked, mm. when they became junior officers, they were able to endow that love to their men. Mm. And they rose. And in retrospect to the characters in my book, um, and there are people like Dorothy Day or Dwight Eisenhower or, or St. Augustine or Samuel Johnson, their dads were eh, but their moms were all amazing. And so there is, there is something about, and I, I think this capacity to love deeply doesn't have to, have to come from parents, but it has right. to come from somewhere. And, and if you can love deeply, I suspect you'll do better off in the world in general. But you don't, you're not saying you love deeply so that you would do better off in the world. That's, right. a, that's a kind of human right. uh, intrinsic value right. Uh, that. Right, my, my, I think most people today, they're way too focused on uh, on the, on the, uh, the promotions, mm. and so they don't need, hey, if you become a saint, you might be able to be CEO. They don't need that. Mm. Uh, they, they, uh, in my view, people just need, you know, you're, you know, I'm sure you're familiar with the work of Christian Smith who went around to college campuses and asked people, um, asked students, what's your last moral dilemma? And 70, he's a sociologist at Notre Dame. 70% of the students couldn't name their last moral dilemma. They said, well, I pulled into a parking space, but I didn't have any quarters. I liked an apartment, but I couldn't afford the rent. And he would say, well, that's sort of a problem. It's not really a moral dilemma. And his argument was that they had not been given the vocabulary to understand what happens when two value systems conflict. And so they were, they were reduced to sort of a emotivism. What feels good for me is good for me. What feels good for you is good for you. And if you're reduced to that, then you really can't have a moral argument. You can't track your own moral development. You don't have the handholds to do that. And so one of the things that seemed to me important was to introduce theological words into the secular sphere. Uh, and so words like sin. I did a, before I went, before the book came out, I did a Charlie Rose, and he asked me about the book, and I talked about it, and I got an email from an editor, not at my house, at another house, a very, very smart editor. Uh, and he said, you know, I love the way you talked about your book, but I wouldn't use the word sin. I'd use the word insensitive. <laughs> and it was like, well, that's why I'm writing the book. <laughs> because insensitive is not sin. Uh, but then you have the question, how do you introduce sin into yeah. the secular conversation? I mean, my, I think my calling for the last third of my career, whatever it is, is to try to shift the conversation a little out of politics and into morality. Just because I think our, our, like a, the sh work I do as a TV pundit it's over-politicized and under-moralized. So I'd like to just shift it a little. But, but you've got to meet people where they are. But will morality get you to sin? I think, you, I think, if, I think sin is wrong, central. Right? It, 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 it'll get you to something being wrong, something being, but will it get you to sin? I think if you don't have a pervasive sense, there's something fundamentally screwed up about our nature, that we're both splendidly endowed and deeply broken. Right, right. Then you're just not accurate. And so the question is, how do you get there? And actually, I talked to a pastor, a very famous one, uh, who I'm sure you know, named Tim Keller. And uh, I said, how do I talk about sin? And he said, don't talk about depravity. That's not going to sell. Or it's not, it's not where people are. Talk about <laughs> disordered loves. Mm. And so, you know, we all love a lot of things. Uh, and if a friend bl gives you a secret, and you've blabbed it at a dinner party, you're putting your love of popularity above your love of friendship. And we know that's wrong. Mm. And so that's sort of a accessible, I hope, a secular way of describing what sin is. We have a tendency to put a lower love above a higher love, and we do it all the time. And so, but introducing that concept of sinfulness, it seems to me, is, is core to character development. The whole logic of character development is based on identifying your core sins, whether it's vanity, greed, fear, and then trying every day to overcome it. And that's the first step in the process toward, I would say, flourishing, the ability to co confront your own sinfulness. So, so the big, the big uh, if there's a big enemy in, uh, in your book, it's the kind of big me, right? In the sense uh, that 
we've become a culture of the big, uh, big means. I'm, so let's say I'm persuaded. I'm persuaded by you on this. But what exactly is wrong with the big me? A large percentage of Americans seem to relish the big me, and many of them identified, have identified with the huge me uh, in the... <laughs> uh, right? Uh, and so, so how do I... How do you go about persuading folks that there's a problem with the big me, or what are the motivations for that, or what are the motivations your cardinal virtue as opposed to the big, right. uh, big me is humility? Not so much little me, but the right. humility. Right? Yeah. But how do I motivate humility? Yeah. I'm thinking I'm a Nietzschean, and you, t you talk to me about humility. I'm thinking I'm Marxist, and you talk to me uh, about humility. I'm thinking I am kind of uh, a libertarian of a certain sort. Uh, where do I get it? What are the reasons, motivations for it? Yeah, well, first, humility in me is not thinking lowly of yourself. It's accurate self-awareness from a position of other-centeredness. Mm -hmm. It's the ability to be outside yourself and to see yourself accurately and see both your strengths and your weaknesses. And so that, that's what humility is. I would say the reason the big me is an unsatisfying life is because, I, I mean, I use the term that I guess Isaiah Berlin got from Kant, the crooked timber of humanity. Right. And so we are all crooked timber, and if you're relying on your own golden angel inside to lead you aright all the time, you're lying, relying on a very flawed instrument. And so the argument was, you sh the argument of the book, and I think it's insufficient now, but the argument of the book was you have to confront your broken nature, why you're crooked timber, mm -hmm. and work every day to, to get better at it. I think what was wrong with the book was even, was it was too individualistic. And in retrospect, the people I wrote about who really made something very impressive of themselves, they were, they were not only capable of confronting their sinfulness, which Dwight Eisenhower was, his anger, or Dorothy Day was, her just the disorganized self-indulgence she had as a young woman, but they were able, capable of making these amazing commitments to other things. And, and so they, were, they committed to four things, which was, and I think a life of flourishing, if I defined a life of flourishing, it was the quality of commitment to four things, to uh, a vocation, to a faith or a philosophy, to a community, and to a spouse and a family. And if you can make awesome commitments to four things outside yourself, and surrender yourself to those four things and forget yourself to those four things, then the byproduct of that, well, that is a life of flourishing, and the byproduct of that is the inner light, the joy that you see in people who are deeply invested in a cause, in a family, and who know what they believe. So, so uh, let, let me build on that. So you don't think that um, life of flourishing to a significant degree depends on the kind of food that's available to you, kind of health that you might or might not have, kind of p political, social arrangements that might be uh, available. Do you, is this a component of flourishing, maybe not as important as the other? Or do you think, are, are you a stoic in some ways? <laughs> no, I'm the opposite. You're the opposite. Uh, <laughs> I'm emotionally irrational. Uh, but, uh, but I would say, I would say it, you probably need to have a, a ceiling of those things, mm. but uh, I, would say, I, I would say in exceptional circumstances, we can think of circumstances where f people were deeply flourishing without those things. Right. Maybe Dietrich Bonhoeffer yeah, yeah. in World War II, or the, the, the Victor Frankl, the, the, this book, Man's Search for Meaning, he describes a woman who's days away from her death in the camps, in the Holocaust, uh, and she's, he, Says to, she says to him, you know, I'm glad life has hit me so hard. Yeah. Because before this, I did not take life seriously, and now I do. And she's alone up there in the bed she'll die in, and she looks out the window and she can see a tree. And she, said, she says, the tree is my only friend. And I talk to the tree. And he says to her, does the tree talk back to you? And she says, yes, the tree says to me, I am life, I am life, I am eternal life. I would say at that moment, with that woman's sense of fullness, with her, not her own life, but just eternal life, I would say she's flourishing at that moment. I think she's doing something, she's having an absolutely extraordinary experience. Um, 
deeply human experience. But I can't get away from the kind of entirety of the traditions, religious traditions, which imagine flourishing under the images of lion will lie together with the lamb. Every person will sit under their own vine and fig tree. Have, uh, th there's going to be a, a kind of sense of community and the world ordered aright into which I'm situated. Or let me put it, uh, let me put it uh, through a, a, a different image in, in, the, in the biblical, in the gospel traditions. You have an imagination of the world to come as entering into joy. Not myself being joyous, notwithstanding the circumstances in which I find myself, but rather a, a kind of almost joy describing the entirety of the environment in which I'm situated. It's my joy, but I have entered into it, right? And so I, 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 where does this <laughs> fullness of flourishing? Yeah, well, listen, I'm not like, when I teach my classes, I'm not saying you should be dying in a Holocaust camp. Like, that's not my life recommendation. <laughs> uh, but I, I, I would say a couple things. One is I, I, I'm trying to describe, when I talk about the commitments, I'm trying to like, describe a life deeply embedded. Mm. So one of my characters, uh, Frances Perkins, witnessed the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory Fire. And she watched 58 people, rather than being burned to death, jump to their deaths in Lower Manhattan. Yeah. And it was sort of her call within a call, the moment when she became not only a do-gooder, which she already was, but ferociously dedicated to the cause of worker safety, which she then would spend the next 50 years ferociously dedicated. I mean ferocious, compromising with anybody, working with anybody, doing anything for the cause of worker safety. And so she was a person deeply embedded in the world. But she wasn't always happy. But she was uh, fulfilled. I have a friend who works in government, and she says, you know, every day in government sucks, but the whole experience is tre tremendously rewarding. <laughs> and so sometimes that's yeah, true. Yeah, yeah. No, I, yeah, yeah. Uh, but, so so I, I, I certainly think that um, these kinds of experiences uh, speak to the greatness of the character, and sometimes we need to go through these kinds of experiences in order to discover, actually, right. our own calling and depth of, uh, of, of our character and what we are able or not able to do. But it seems to me that those are kind of the stages on some way, yeah. right? The stages, maybe necessary stages, necessary not just for me, but sometimes I sacrifice my, uh, myself for the benefit uh, of others, ne necessary stages given the state of the world in which we find ourselves. But the kind of image of flourishing life is this fullness in which all participants toward which we are through these sacrifices moving, right? Or something yeah. of that sort. Yeah. So you're Mr. Joy, so I hesitate to have my own definition in front of you. But, uh, uh, but you know, I would say you have, w w when we talk about a flourishing life, the, it would have to include suffering. It would have to include moments of suffering where, you know, which teach us things, which teach us about ourselves, which enlarge our capacity for, for empathy, uh, and which we turn into moments of uh, narratives of sort of redemption. It would have to include love, uh, moments of deep and passionate love to sort of plow open the ground uh, and to uh, and just enlarge our hearts. It would have to include moments of awed beauty. And then I think I would get back to the moments when it comes together. Um, you know, I, I talk, and it, this happened a long time ago, that I, don't, I don't mention the book, but you, we all have moments in our life where we have moments where we think joy. And the one I talk about sometimes is, is um, I was doing the, the news hour on PBS and it was a summer evening and it was like 10 years ago and I drove home to where I was living with my family uh, then in Bethesda, Maryland and my kids who were then 12, 9 and 4 had a little Safeway ball, a little one of those plastic balls you get at the, the grocery store and they were kicking it up in the air and they were chasing each other across the yard and they were rolling over each other and tumbling and laughing and just having a great time and it was like the perfect summer evening. The, Summer sun was coming in, my grass for some reason looked great. Uh, and so I pull into my driveway with traps around the side of my house and I'm confronted with this tableau of family happiness. And I just sit there staring at it through the windshield. And it's one of those moments where you get overwhelmed by a gratitude which you know you haven't earned. 
and you want to be worthy of such moments. And so that's a moment of flourishing, but it, it doesn't feel like something you've earned. It's something, it's a superabundance of what you've earned. And, and that's why the transcendent element, element is always in the room. It's yeah. always and in a sense, that, that's how I think about joy uh, as well. If it's completely earned, I mean, I, I sometimes uh, say, you know, w when you get pay, paycheck at the end of the month, you know, you rejoice that you have a job that uh, pays you, but it's when you get the bonus right. <laughs> at the end of your year that, that it, it is a source of uh, true yeah. joy. Yeah. There's something, there's kind of gratuity right. to joy, which I think is very significant. But I would say joy could also come in the form of deficit. There are moments like, well, we've screwed up the word eros in our culture, the longing for excellence. Mm -hmm. Like when C.S. Lewis uses the words joy, he doesn't mean the satisfaction of desires, yeah, he means the longing. Yeah, yeah. And Dorothy Day, her book, The Long Loneliness, loneliness for her is not solitude. It's, um, uh, it's the longing for God, really. Mm. And so it's not the satisfaction of desire, it's the desire itself. And so there's something about joy that's involved in the search. And so for, again, I'm talking about myself, but I'm a columnist. Uh, <laughs> but, so there are moments, we, we can all relate to this at work. Where, so what I do, the way I write is I, I have a very bad memory, so I lo have lots of pages of notes and stuff, and I lay it out on the floor. And each paragraph, each, par each pile of paper on my floor, my living room is a par yeah, Put exactly. On the floor, yeah. So that's, that's uh, each, each pile is a paragraph of my column. And I pick up the pile of papers, write the paragraph, throw it out, pick up the next pile. So to me, the writing process is the process of crawling around on my living room floor. <laughs> and sometimes when I'm at the edge of my knowledge and understanding and concepts are happening to me and I'm aware that thoughts are coming into my mind, those are like very joyful moments. Mm -hmm. and, that, and it feels like prayer. It's like you're, you're enraptured in something. And it's not because you've achieved it, but you're on the road. You're, you're on the motion. Yeah. Joy, joy is in anticipation in the Christian terms. It's Advent kind of uh, right. joy as well as in the, uh, as in the fulfillment. Um, let me take you a little bit to, to less happy topics okay. <laughs> than, than joy. Uh, I, and Ted Cruz? Is that where we're going? <laughs> well, we could, we could start with Ted Cruz or maybe Donald Trump or <laughs> the big me. Uh, um, and in some ways, I think both of them and maybe a few others uh, uh, as well. Um, so, and the relationship of the kind of cultural occupation of the kind of the big me and uh, the kind of market economy that we today uh, inhabit, not only generating immense disparities of wealth, but also being highly, highly competitive. And this high competitiveness of the market, I need to always present myself in my best suit. Uh, from the moment I get up, I need to look in a certain way, and I'm constantly being projecting myself um, and selling myself in order to be uh, simply able to achieve the goals which I have in order to, in order to live. Um, is there a surprise that we strive for the big me if our entire way of life is organized about, is a condition of possibility of our, my, our entire life is the being of the big me? Yeah. So well, how does your critique of the big me, as well as the solution, fit in the, in the, what do you do with the economy which produces the need for the big me all the time? Well, but I would say, obviously, if you're starting a, a um, doing a startup, or trying to make yourself into a public intellectual, or trying to make yourself well-known in the world of marketing, or whatever sphere, obviously, self-promotion, Instagram, Twitter, is a part of that, and it's part of the self-promotion. And one of the things I mentioned in the book is how much fame has gone from a value that was very unpopular. UCLA does these studies of yeah, yeah. college freshmen. And it used to be what people wanted, they ask you, what do you want out of college or life? And it's, I want to have a meaningful philosophy of life. And fame, which used to be down near the bottom, is now usually second or third after financial security. Uh, and so fa becoming famous has become a very desired thing. Mm -hmm. And my famous, my favorite study of this is, uh, <laughs> uh, is they ask college students, would you rather have a life that leads to a lot of fame or a life that leads to a lot of sex? And by two to one, they chose the life of fame. Uh, and so I go to college campus and I say, listen, I'm, I'm on TV a lot. I write a column for a prominent newspaper. I'm kind of famous. 
go with the sex, it's better. Uh, <laughs> and, and, <laughs> so, but so that's part of one's career. Uh, nonetheless, if that's all you are, uh, you really will turn into Donald Trump. <laughs> I mean, you, you, will have, you will have no inner life. Uh, and my supposition is that having no inner life is a bad thing in the long run. So, but, but that's... <laughs> <laughs> but, so, I'm not saying you should deny that... I mean, this is what, where Soloveitchik comes in. He's not saying deny your Adam one. Yeah. But it, it's realize that it's intention. These two things are in our intention with the other side of your life. And it, it, my argument is the same as yours. You need a, you need a counterculture within yourself. Yeah, yeah. You need an inner hold. Somebody, you, you know, the natural urge is to just want to make it in this world. And that's what the world rewards. And so you need some other community, some other value system, some other set of commitments that just impose upon you a different set of standards. And, and you know, to get back to what will help you in the long run, I have a friend who hires a lot of people, and the question he asks at every job interview is, name a time you told the truth and it hurt you. Because he wants to know they're gonna put Adam two above Adam one sometimes. And so I tell all my students, learn to fake that one. <laughs> 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 but you don't, you don't want, uh... I, I, I don't hear you pushing at the, at the kind of systemic question. So as a public intellectual, you're attending to the cultural responses to the, the, the situation. You're not asking the question, am I hearing you rightly? About how to, is there something not quite all right with a system that's system. generating such huge discrepancies in wealth and yeah, such? No. I wrote about that all the time, but yeah. I would say that uh, you're getting into my business and I'm getting into your business. Well, wait, wait, uh, wait, wait, I, no, 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 that's not right. <laughs> okay, well, what I mean to say is I just think there is a vacuum for people to think about their own internal lives. Oh, I'm, I'm yeah. great. And, I'm and you know, I, I was talking to some people just before this. I went on this book tour and I'm talking about Augustine and love and Dorothy Day and moments of suffering and grace. And on this book tour, I sometimes going to rooms, I'm at a big convention center, there's a bunch of CEOs and treasurers and they're talking about healthcare costs and their fiduciary responsibilities and they look like the least spiritual entities on the face of the earth. And I walk in and I'm gonna do all this wahoo stuff about love. And I walk into the room at an airless convention center and I think, this is not gonna go well. Uh, and most of the time, they lock in and more than any other talk or more than any other subject I've ever spoken about, there's a quality to the silence in some of those rooms, which is the quality of a desperate, thirsty group of people, and you're just like a sprinkler in the desert. And it feels like, it just feels to me the country is just hungry for this, and you don't even have to be that good, but if you're offering some bit of it, then there's a thirst for it. And I've had my students here say, we're so thirsty, which is why your class is so popular, aside from your talents, of course. <laughs> You're preaching to the choir, uh, choir here. I think it, it's uh, where I'm headed partly with it is this more integral account of, uh, yeah. of flourishing. I mean, it, there, there is a way in which I can find my own personal meaning without that translating into kind of a transformed lives that irradiate not just to my environments, but also to social, social institutions. Yeah. But I think we are probably... I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't disagree, but yeah. I just remind you, Emerson said souls are not saved in bundles. That they're, yeah, they're, yeah. There's, I mean, I, I, believe me, I'm, half my columns are on social conditions and why Donald yeah. Trump sucks. But, um, <laughs> so I don't, I don't deny the importance of that, but I just think if you look at the, the, where the public debate is, what's most needed is moral language to personal, uh, the per we are a country that's politics rich and meaning poor. And the personal search for meaning is the, is the biggest need. So, so we won't have disagreement uh, on that, but let, let's take from there. Um, I think what might be needed 
So, so let's assume that, let's think that we assume where the, where the end, the road toward character ends. But what happens along the way? What are the kind of practices and helps along the way that one can, one needs to have, not just to have moral ideal in front of one, but rather religious tradition, philosophic, ancient philosophical tradition saw themselves as kind of communities of particular practices in order to help you along the way. How do you imagine that? Well, I, my answers are not uh, controversial. I mean, you, you have to experience great love. We wouldn't say somebody was a deep person unless they were capable of, of great love uh, that fused them uh, one with another. Uh, we wouldn't say someone was, was a deep and emotionally successful person unless they'd overcome some challenge and suffering. Uh, Paul Tillich, uh, who I quote in the book, says that what suffering does is it takes you beneath the everydayness of your life and carves a hole in what you thought was the basement of your soul, and it reveals a cavity below, and then it carves a hole in that and reveals a cavity below. And so it really introduces yourself to yourself. And then we wouldn't say somebody was a deep person unless they were deeply involved in some act of service. And so I quote, um, oh, I'm forgetting his name, I'm blank, having a moment. He was a famous doctor in the 19th century. He was a musicologist, and then he, Albert Schweitzer. Uh, and he said, I only hire people for my hospital. I don't hire idealists for my hospital. I only hire people who perform acts of service as if they're doing the dishes. Because those who are looking for the validation of the idealism are not going to be able to last out here. And so we, we look for moments like that. Uh, and then, you know, I, so I, I think it's, you know, some, and then I think, you know, this, here's the University of Chicago and me coming out. I do think you have to do the reading. I do think you have to be <laughs> familiar. Good, thank you. This is yeah. very important. <laughs> do the reading. <laughs> so, so I went to Chicago and we had a great, great books program. It was like DS for two years. And when I went there, there were still these old German refugees from World War II who read the great books, whether it was Nietzsche or Hobbes or Locke, and that their belief was, this was their religion. The, the, the keys to life were in these great books. And I remember there was a guy named Carl Weintraub who was a legendary professor who really was the greatest of the Western Civ teachers. And he wrote to a friend of mine, a classmate of mine, who's now president of David College, just before he left, he, he died. I taught these books as if the men and women who wrote them which they did, had sacrificed their life and blood and soul and spirits to put what they knew into these books. And I tried to teach them with the passion and the respect to which they deserved. But sometimes when I would hear words from my students, it sounded like they were just pushing around air. And I taught this for 50 years, and I think I made an impact on some of my students, but I just don't know. And that's the lament of a guy who, who taught until he was you know, in his 80s. And he just didn't know the impact it had. Mm. But he communicated the value of those books, which all of his students then carried through life, the passionate for these ideas. And my view is if you know, we tell students, come up with your own value systems. If your name is Aristotle or Nietzsche, maybe you can do that. <laughs> the rest of us need to latch on to a tradition much wiser than we mm. can be. Mm. And you simply don't know what the moral traditions are unless you do the reading. Mm. So I do think reading is an essential component. And then other things like being aroused by beauty, by awed by beauty and drawn toward beauty. I mean, we can all, moments of transcendence. I think colleges can have a role in giving people moments of transcendence by offering them beautiful things uh, to look at, by encouraging them to fall in love with things. Uh, and so, you know, I think colleges play that role as part of, part of the step, a role I think are mostly being abdicated right now. I had one more question for you, but this is a marvelous uh, ending point to our conversation. Uh, please join me in thanking uh, David Brooks. Thank
Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, I hope that this is actually just, uh, our, this conversation is done, but I hope this is actually just the beginning of a larger conversation we can have together. Um, you'll see uh, actually a section in your program described uh, continuing the conversation. Um, I just want to take a, a moment to highlight one uh, way that you can continue to engage. Um, as I said at the start, it's crucial uh, for us that we engage this conversation across important and enduring lines of difference. And over the years, we've had the great privilege to have some great um, guests come and visit our course and visit the campus, uh, including uh, Rabbi Jonathan Sachs last year and visited the course. Uh, this, this year, on April 6th, uh, note the date, the wrong date is in your program, April 6th, uh, we will be hosting uh, Sheikh Hamza Yusuf, uh, perhaps the most uh, influential Islamic scholar in the Western world, uh, who will give a public lecture on uh, a Muslim vision of a life worth living. Um, and after the Sheikh's lecture, uh, he and Professor Wolf will engage in a brief interfaith conversation about the good life. Um, so please be sure to join us uh, for that. Um, more immediately, there are other opportunities to continue. There will be a book signing just across the street, across Elm Street and Calhoun College. Uh, both uh, David Brooks and Miroslav Wolf will be there. Uh, uh, it, uh, will be there. And if you have reserved a spot in the table conversations, those are also just about to get started, also at Calhoun. Um, otherwise, please do uh, stay in touch with us uh, various ways in your program, and uh, we'll look forward to seeing you back here in April. If you would join me one last time in thanking our guests.